Welcome to episode seven, Tales from a Disappearing City. Joined once again by Neil Transpontine. Last episode, Neil, we talked about your journey from underground Luton to, to the big city, London. Do you want to just continue on from there? Like, you know, what it was like when you when you first turned up in London? Yeah, I first moved down to London in uh, early 1987. And I was uh, living, first of all, in a squat on the Tulsa Estate in, in Brixton. I mean, I think one of the things from that period is, you know, there was a lot of empty housing around in London, a lot of cheap housing. If people weren't squatting, they could often get a tenancy. Yeah, we talked about this with Howard, like about the, the scene in the 80s. And yeah, I think if you're under a certain age, it's, it's a bit hard to imagine that you could literally move to London sometimes and just find a place to live. With virtually no, well, yeah, with no money. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe sign on the dole and like, you know, I mean, there is something about them times where like, you know, much as I hate the Conservatives and the Thatcher government, you know, there almost is a period of people being able to sign on the dole and do all these like uh, music and stuff. You could survive doing that sort of stuff in the 80s and have cheap housing, obviously nothing to do with Thatcher at the Tories, but they hadn't closed all the loopholes by then, basically, had they? I don't think, was, yeah, we can give Thatcher the credit for that. I think they they, they, they kind of uh, inherited that and gradually uh, shut it all down. And, uh, you know, and I think it's, I'm sorry I'm about how people talk about that now, because sometimes people say, oh, it's a golden age and, uh, you know, we had, it's impossible for young people now to create or be politically active. You know, it's, it's obviously very hard housing-wise, but People always find, find ways to make music and, you know, it's, all, it's a bit... No, of... exactly. I mean, yeah, I get a bit sick of that. And I do, I've talked before about how I've got friends of mine who, like, move to London, then they leave London and then they're just like, yeah, London shit now and blah, blah, blah. It's so rubbish and all this sort of stuff. And it ain't, you know. I mean, yeah, there's loads of bad things and it's, yeah, it's hard to live in London cheaply now. Uh, but some of us have actually grew up here or live here and, you know, yeah, maybe maybe I'm lucky I'm in social housing, but it's still a great city. There's still loads of cool stuff going on. And yeah. 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 And part of these chats that I'm doing here. Exactly. Yeah. I really don't want it just to be like, uh, you know, because, you know, I'm conscious that, you know, I do want to get a, f- a few younger voices on here and I don't just want to be like, yeah, when it's so, when it's so great back in the day and it's all rubbish now, because yeah. I don't think that. But obviously, yeah. we're talking about the history. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I don't want it just to be... We talk about the history, but in, yeah. not in a nostalgic way. Exactly. And certainly not in a yeah. way of saying it was better then than it was now. You know, Exactly, because people still go to me, oh, yeah, the, yeah, there's, yeah there's no good mu- music, or like, the music was way better. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's loads of brilliant music coming out at the moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's bollocks, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And every, every, you know, everyone thinks the time... And the, yeah, when I'm, they sure, were I'm, sure, I'm sure you'd love to go back to late 70s Luton, wouldn't you, in your time machine, and you'd, you'd love it to go back to that time. Yeah. 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 Anyway, back, yeah, back, to, yeah. back to squats in uh, South London. No, thank you. Anyway, back, back, back on track, yes. Let's talk about, about being in Brixton in the, in the uh, late 80s. I mean, one of the things is, we, we were saying in the last episode about, you know, this sense that people have that there was like, a dead period and then and then punk came along and there's a similar thing narrative about uh the late 1980s i think where people sometimes talk about oh you know in the 80s it was it had all gone bad it was all like dead music and then uh along comes acid house and way that's the new revolution um whereas you know i i don't really feel that that immediate kind of pre pre-rape or pre pre-house music period was a, a, a a dead period in, in music. I mean, it's true, um, there's a lot of, uh, when you're out clubbing it, a lot of old music's been played, the kind of, you know, the rare groove type stuff. Yeah, I used to go to um, The Fridge, um, down where Jay Strongman um, did a night, he used to go to the Electric Ballroom and places like that, and in Camden, and you, and you would hear a lot of old music, uh, even going to the, um, the Town and Country Club, where the Wendy May's Locomotion was a big night, playing loads of old stacks and 60s and 70s. When, whenever I hear Jackson Sisters, I Believe in Miracles, yeah. I always think of that night. Absolutely, yeah, transported. So, and yeah, so, in, but it, it, it was partly retro, but it wasn't uh, totally backward looking. I think a lot of people were getting into a lot of that music off the back of, um, of hearing samples of on yeah, the, uh, hip-hop records and so, then going back and finding the source. You know, like Mr. Big Stuff, for instance, that was... But G9, that was a massive track at, at Wendy May's Club, and that was all... Yeah, well, the, 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 you know, I actually saw 
Uh, the JBs play, I think, at the Town and Country Club in 1987, I think it was. And, like, they played two nights. And, like, basically, that 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 is one of the best gigs I've ever seen. It was literally all the people. It was, like, Bobby Bird, Marva Whitney, Lynn Collins, Fred Wesley, Maceo Parker. The whole place was packed with literally all the people who had gone to all the rare groove funk warehouse parties. And basically, like, they would, you know, and it was like a um, homecoming for them. It was, it was a bit like, I guess, how some people talk about some of the Northern Soul stars coming over to play in the UK when they couldn't get arrested in America. And it was, it was a bit like, people forget yeah. that. Like, a lot of that, them old sort of records, they were just disappeared. And it was almost like um, they'd been resurrected, you know, by... Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying it just on the London club scene, but that they made them people stars again. Yeah, and all those people you mentioned, it was, it was really all their, their... Yeah, exactly, on on people, like James James Brown's People la- label, where he put out, if he, he produced a lot of the records. I don't know how much he produced them, but he, he produced them. He'd be in the background sometimes, but yeah, it, w- it would be like members of his, of the JBs, and yeah, like I said, like some of the some of the great female singers that he had, like, like I said, Vicky Anderson and Lynn Collins had... It'd be on them records. So that that was obviously very big at the time, but also you had new music come along at the same time. You had you know, it was like um, go go and trouble funk and all that kind of stuff, and a lot and a lot of uh, electronic dance records, which people now call boogie, which people didn't used to call it very many, normally people call yeah. it at the time. But you know, all the sort of Mantronics and Joy Sims and um, the Jam and Lewis product. Yeah, I'm going to give a bit. Big shout out to Janice Jackson, <laughs> Janet Jackson's uh, control, you know, that Jam and Lewis production, all, all that. It was, it was actually quite exciting with the electronic music as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to go to a club called Delirium, which was at um, uh, London Astoria. And that would be like a, a mixture of like hip hop, funk. And like they famously played some early house there like Noel and Morris Watson, and a lot of the people actually started throwing bottles at them because they, they, they didn't want to hear this gay music, you know. You know, it wasn't quite as tolerant as, uh, again, like, that, that. that's the other thing about, you know, people having um, a misty-eyed nostalgia, you know. You know th- yeah, when they first started playing some of the early house work, I'm talking about 85, yeah. 86, yeah, because it wasn't funk and it wasn't hip-hop, it was seen yeah. as... Yeah, gay music basically, and yeah, but I think quite often you go out, you might hear a few house records in in the in the course of, an, of a more kind of mixed set when you. So it, it was it was a few years before there were clubs playing just house music, but house music, as you say, was ticking ticking under from uh, from about eighty five onwards, and you just hear a bit of it here and there. Um, so there wasn't really, I don't, I don't, yeah, obviously there was a point when the whole thing exploded into something new, but. It, it kind of was emerging within what was already there to some extent. And uh, I went, yeah, I think Howard mentioned about Howard when you talked to him a few weeks ago, talked about going to the PSV club in Manchester. Yeah, do you want to explain what that was again, the, the Manchester PSV? The PSV club, I think, I can't remember what the PSV stands for, but I think it might be something like public service vehicles because it was originally the uh, social club for bus drivers and, um, and other people. It then became a predominantly African Caribbean club in, um, I think it was sort of Hume, wasn't it, in Manchester? I think an early incarnation of the, the factory was there, wasn't it? The factory records night that they had, they they did, they put nights on there. But they had had like a big kind of weekend nights, and again it was this kind of. I saw a flyer for it actually recently, nine eight seven flyer, and it's got you know all this different kind of stuff in it, like Mantronics. I think it says LL Cool J, <laughs> um, and it's got Tackhead on there. So you got, you know, you, you had another of these places where you'd be hearing a mixture of all kinds of different old and new uh, and emerging dance musics all all mashed up in one night. So I think that was what a lot of it was like in that kind of uh, mid mid to late yeah, 80s. Yeah, no, the, the, exactly. Well, the, no, it was that weird little sort of melting point. And I remember I was buying quite a lot of these I guess, what do they call it, like EBM sort of uh, records. And one place I'd get them from is Rough Trade, like either in the West London one or, or the one in Central London, but mostly the one in, yeah, the West London Talbot Road one. And, yeah, I'd be searching out all these records and, like, Fats Comet, yeah. who were, like, sort of offshoot of Tackhead and all that sort of stuff. And we obviously talked about Mark Stewart quite a bit, or them sort of, and Keith LeBlanc. Yeah. 
and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, that stuff was amazing. And I like some of the electronic stuff coming out, but it still wasn't quite hitting, hitting, you know, exactly what I wanted. And yeah, but like you said, it was all bubbling along before, yeah. before Acid House came along. Yeah, and there was obviously, obviously lots of different scenes going on as as always. Um, yeah, there's quite a big what, what was known at the time as a world music scene, which is a terrible name, but I don't know what planet the other music came from. If that was the world music, but um, yeah, there's a big club in Brixton called the Mambo Inn where. A lot of uh, it's all sort of Latin. Yeah, that was in a hotel, wasn't it? Around the back street or something. Yeah, yeah, it's a big club. Yeah, and um, did you ever go Whirly Gig? Did you ever go Whirly Gig? Yeah, Whirly Gig as well. That's another place where. Oh man, <laughs> I think it's still going strong. Is it DJ Monkey Pilot? Is he still? Yeah, I mean, um, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember when it was in Leicester Square. Like, do you remember, did you ever go when it was in Leicester Square? Yeah, because it was in that Notre Dame Hall. Which like that's that is like if you know your your punk history, that's where oh, like yeah. Sex Pistols yeah, that yeah. gig that I think seventy six or something or the London show filmed it, and like it's classic like loads of like OG punks pogoing about. Um, but yeah, they I I had a flatmate and like they um, yeah they, they they were into that like and yeah I ended up going down Whirly Gig a few times and. It, it was always a bit weird because it was a bit hippy dippy. It wasn't quite the uh, coolest club, was it, in the world? No, it was fun though. Yeah, Notre Dame because that's that's an interesting place, isn't it? Because uh, the church that's that's attached to has got these um, Jean Cocteau paintings on the wall, uh, so that's also also worth a visit if you. Which maybe we'll check that out another time. But yeah, so yeah, the World Gig that was a, that was a mixture of that kind of you know world music, you know. Yeah, it kind of was that that vibe and. Didn't they? They brought all the parachute thing out at the end. Do you remember all that? I used to hate all that bit, but like... yes, there was a bit at the end. I mean, <laughs> but just to explain for people who weren't there, <laughs> um, basically at, at the end of the night, um, everyone used to get down on the floor, sit down, lie down, and they brought out this massive silk parachute which co- covered the yeah. whole. Yeah, what was floor. the point of that? Yeah. Like, what, what, was, what was meant about? Because I got remember, I was always, a bit, I was a bit. I was still felt I was kind of punky then. I was a bit like, what's this hippie shit? But yeah, but I think, you know. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, because there was no alcohol there. Um, so that was, that was, that was uh, yeah, one of the, uh, an, a, quite a big night, I guess. It's something that suddenly came on throughout the 90s. All right. Shout outs to Monkey Pilot. Yeah, shout out to DJ Monkey Pilot. And also uh, Trans Global Underground, people like that. They were very, very much associated with that. I actually think loads of people would have gone to like Whirly Gig and, you know, they're probably not, you know, may, maybe there is a great book to be written about Whirly Gig, you know, rather than some of the other cooler clubs. But, you know, it's like yeah, they definitely had, a, you know, had their own little unique take on stuff. And it, like you said, it was an interesting, it was an interesting mixture of music, you know. Yeah. You know, they play some long Tangerine Dream records and stuff like that as well. Yeah. And I do remember going to the first time I went to, I think St. Jackson's Lane Community Centre in North London. I went to this ambient club and it was like the first time I've been to a, I mean, that was kind of early ambient and going in there and uh, being horrified that there were kind of mattresses on the floor and people sit, sitting and lying around on mattresses in a nightclub. But uh, yeah, you know, you get into the vibe. In the early acid, I said all them sort of like chill out rooms and they had the, you know, the brain machines, all that sort of stuff. So, and obviously we can go into Megatripolis and all, you know, that, so there, there definitely was like, the you know, it was almost like Revenge of the Hippies for, for a certain bit. I guess. So I guess there was a lot, yeah, there's, a lot, there's always a lot of different things going on. Uh, I, mean, I wasn't really someone who can say they immediately jumped on board kind of, uh, you know, Acid House and stuff. Um, I didn't go to shoot any of those kind of places. So late 80s and early 90s, you know, I was very involved in um, in radical politics, you know, particularly around, uh, I guess, uh, Gulf War and poll tax and anti-fascism and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, we t- we talked about that with Howard, and you know, like when when did you first go down the one to one? I first went down there when I first came down to London. Some friends of mine used to put on nights there on on a Friday night, a sort of club night there. Um, but probably more regularly from the early nineties, not not ninety one sort of time. Um, and we'll come on to that in a minute because that will bring us around to uh, one club in particular. But I guess um, you know through that whole period sort of late 80s, early 90s, um, there was a, yeah, this kind of emerge, from from that whole kind of, uh, I guess, you know, benefits and squat party type scene, 
Um, another thing people don't, you know, in cultures of the time, doesn't really get read about very much is the huge, what was uh, disparagingly known as the, the crusty scene. <laughs> but, you know, bands like uh, RDF, Back to the Planet, and obviously you, you know about Rough Rough and Ready, you may say about that in a minute, but and these bands who came out often of um, the squat scene, um, often sort of quite a, the reggae or a ska kind of influence. They were massive in the, in the early 90s, you know. Definitely sort of cute people queuing around the block. The festivals in the parks, like in Fordham Park, in New Cross, where they had the uh, Deptford Tree Festival and the Hackney Homeless Festival. You know, I, I did a club in 87, and I think that's where I met Rough Rough and Ready, because I was doing a Wednesday night... 87 it was sort of acid house and sort of funk sort of night and they come and played you know so that's how i met all them lot and you know i've i've found i've got a flyer somewhere of me doing this party i think it's 87 in uh, some garden in uh brixton uh, and there's all like acid house smileys on it you know so yeah so you you ended up um kind of being their resident dj didn't you for a from ready yeah, I'd, I'd I'd go and play sort of music at that at their gigs, and I'd be playing like a mixture of, you know, stuff like Keith LeBlanc and uh, early sort of dance records, and a bit of funk and a bit of, bit of this, bit of that, really. Um, but yeah, like you said, it was a massive sort of scene that yeah, the crusty underground traveller sort of scene. So from from that scene, um, yeah, there was quite a few sort of big. Uh, squat party type places wasn't there I remember going to there was a school in Stockwell um, that must be 1991 Priory Grove there was a, a squatted school where they put on some big parties there was a place behind the Joiners Arms in Camberwell I remember seeing RDF down there I think it was oh, a okay, yeah. former social services building that was squatted and there, and there was a famous uh, call town in uh, in Brixton, which was the old Dole office. Cooltown, I think, first of all, by 1992, the reason they were called Cooltown was because there was a, a suntan factory in, in Ephra Road, um, which was where they had their first parties, went to some of those. And then later on, different groups of people occupied the uh, the Cooltown building, the old Dole office building. And that went on for a few years. So I think from, from me, from that time, you know, go, I was going along there and... Alongside all these these kind of RDF type bands, yeah, you'd be hearing all the kind of techno and uh, sort of what became the free party sound systems would would often be playing alongside them and next door. Yeah, because there was a little sort of transition, and it was like yeah, the older sort of hippie crew were like not so into like the the dance music sort of stuff. I think they saw it as just people like which you know again I think I talked to get about this for Howard, but they saw it more as just like people getting fucked up and dancing all night which is obviously partly what it was you know it wasn't quite as politically right on maybe but again it's politics of dancing all night is you know it's, it's obviously still <laughs> still valid but yeah it sort of transitioned didn't it from like the old you know the the hippie you know stone end style festival sort of crew to like yeah to the, more, to the free party type stuff yeah yeah there was definitely a crossover and i think with me, well, definitely for me and I guess a lot of people I knew at the time you gradually been drawn more into that side of it than and away from the the band side of it became less less important. Yeah, and there was a, there was a political divide because I think we even had that with rough rough and ready. I played down the Dole House, and I, mean, I just remember there there was a certain bit of like some people really anti about doing all night parties there, you know, and, and they just wanted it to be yeah just more political focused but there's this yeah i mean this comes to the whole whole lot of stuff i was interested in that writing about because it seemed to me that people who thought politics meant you know words in songs and you know, making explicit political statements whereas for me the, what the whole you know different forms of dance music scenes that emerged in the late 80s and into the 90s it was very political just the fact of uh, people from lots of different backgrounds coming together and and dancing together in in a way which was much more inclusive than uh you know just playing to 20 people who looked exactly the same as you in the corner of the pub you know i guess as that, that became more and more of a thing for me personally i started going to um you know some of the more free party places uh, again in the king's cross north london area, i remember going to a few parties in brewery road i think it was up uh, up near maybe it was near holloway road holloway prison 
few places up there. Uh, Hackney Bus Garage was another place. So you, be, the, you know, that was when you're getting all the, the big sound systems playing out, the big free parties, and, you know, going in there and all, like, all the bus... You know, the, I remember going in the bus garage and you got, got all the sort of travellers' vehicles all circled up around the dance floor, you know. And then around that time as well, get, that was when I started going to, to Dead by Dawn, which was... Um, I think you talked hard about it, but basically... It was basically a night that was at the one-to-one centre... Um, and there again, there were arguments. I think people the one to one centres. Yeah. I mean, did you go down there from the start, or were you, did you like? I went to some of the early ones. Yeah. I mean, there were some of the very early ones weren't that busy at the start, but but that became a kind of a main. How long did that last for? Yeah, I think it's ninety four to ninety six. I think I did look up the dates because I wasn't sure when I was speaking to Howard. I think I did actually put a little graphic on screen, but yeah, pretty much ninety four to ninety six. I think they did they did twenty three parties, and the record that they released was the twenty fourth party, I believe. But you know. I wasn't counting at the time. So obviously you played down there, and it was but it's a mixture of, uh, I guess, the harder and faster end of uh, of techno. By the end, the time it finished, it wasn't cool to use the term techno anymore. But at the beginning, people did say that, didn't they? I didn't always like all the music there. You know, I was, you know, I didn't mind a bit of the Gabri sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, R.I.P. Tour used to play down there. Used to play like, you know, really uh, super fast Gabba with her screaming Gabba over the top you know uh, <laughs> um but yeah again it was one of them places where uh you know i mean i actually you know had um i think it was paul from somatics messing me just talking about the dead by dawn and just saying yeah what good memories they have of that place and just meeting loads of people there and you know and sometimes you know that's what all these nights you know like like you say in your blog history is made at night it's it's in places where people meet and um it was it, I, I, I guess, yeah, the argument against it not being political or people just being out their head all night and just, you know, dancing to repetitive beats. But, um, yeah, there was a lot of social interactions there and, you know, and people meeting and, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was a hot spot to meet and mix with people, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, people used to come from all over the country to go there because there weren't many places playing that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, and you always, always lots of interesting conversations going on tiny place really i mean how they manage one toilet doesn't bear thinking about but anyway they did <laughs> uh, so that's quite an important place for me and obviously meeting christoph and all those people and uh, uh that again don't like, over mythologize it you know it wasn't a huge place it was, it was very packed sometimes did you ever go to any of the talks and uh, the only one i can remember was going to uh, sadie plant who um, did a talk there but I, I think i went to one or two others but yeah the talks weren't weren't generally that busy it was really it was late one at night it got it got very busy yeah but around that time obviously it, it, things were becoming more political anyway because you had the uh, criminal justice act coming in you mentioned about repetitive beats obviously the government bringing in the legislation to um ban open air gatherings uh as they put it in the legislation characterized by music characterized by repetitive beats so that was really trying to cl- Crack down on the free party and, and festival scene in particular. And there was obviously quite a big movement against that, you know, big demonstrations. You know, every time you went to party, it was on the flyer, you know, stop the CGA. It was a, lots of records themed around that. And at, at the time, I was actually doing a, I was doing a history um, course where I was researching, uh, I was actually researching Luton, the First World War. And at the end of the first world war was a riot, and they burnt. Can you just tell that down. story about them dragging out the piano? Because is that the one where they dragged the piano in into the street? Yeah, it, during the uh, Luton riot in 1919, the Peace Day riot, uh, there was a, an incident in which the, the local uh, music shop farmers was looted, and people brought piano out in the streets, and they were playing "Keep the Home Fires Burning" as the uh, as the town hall burned down. <laughs> there was no repetitive beats there, were there? It was just that the piano as as Luton burned. So get, as I was going, getting more and more into the scene and uh, criminal justice act stuff was happening, you know, I was getting interested in history at the same time. So I started thinking more about, you know, what the history of uh, dance music, you know. I guess everyone thinks they're the first people who invented uh, staying up at night and dancing, but actually people have always done that one way or another. So I've, it was interesting to kind of think about the history of that and the history of um, movements around, you know, space and, and leisure 
And when there was the uh, big criminal justice act demonstration, it ended up in Hyde Park, where all the sound systems came into the park in defiance of the police. And no, I was right in the middle. I was right in the middle of that, and I nearly got a baton on my head. Actually, I was on one of the the railings and like looking up as all the police charged us. And I pulled my head back and like the copper like hit the truncheon and it hit right on the railing where, where I literally just was and it just missed my head. I would have, yeah, I would have felt that. It was it, it was quite kind of medieval, look at the, the footage now, because you know, you've you got these horses charging across the park, then you see people charging towards them with waving sticks and horses turning around charging back. It was, it was like one of those kind of... No, no, it was incredible. I mean, I remember like we were like, running down Oxford Street at one point and windows are smashing everywhere yeah. and police are charging down with horses. And Hyde Park had, had been a place where there had been this whole history of uh, demonstrations and that, activities where the, um, you know, people had tried to gather when they'd been banned uh, going back to, I think, in the 1860s, there was a thing called the Hyde Park Railings Affair where people went to Hyde Park and pulled down all the railings. And Karl Marx wrote about that. So off the back of all that, I did write a pamphlet called um, The Battle for Hyde Park, which went through from other stuff that happened in Hyde Park through to um, the, the CJA stuff. And off the back of that, um, oh, yeah, that, that, I got a lot of interest in that. I basically ended up being asked to write an edited version of it for this magazine called eternity don't you remember that ended up being like a happy hardcore have you have you got a copy of this have you like oh my god i want to see this yeah happy hardcore yeah, have, and, Hi- yeah, yeah. and hyde park revolution and i did for a little while only about six months or so i have a, a column in mix mag um again where i was trying to it's, it's called back in the day and it was a, sh- a short column basically about historical episodes in dance music history where i tried to smuggle a bit of politics into mix mag which which was quite hard, but, you know, because I, like, so I did something about the history of Pride, um, something about the history of Notting Hill Carnival. Basically, it's just kind of making the point that people have always had to resist. You do a blog called History is Made at Night. Was it, what, were the, what was the thought behind doing that, that blog? Well, that was coming off the back of all that, really. Yeah, yeah th- thinking that originally the, the thought behind it was, uh, yeah, documenting things that have, have, I've been involved in, but also looking back to earlier times uh, historical uh, music scenes, dance scenes, um, and some of the politics around that as well. Obviously, over the time, it's, it kind of uh, it's, it's ebbed and flowed and, uh, and gone off in various different directions, but that's, that's always been, been the core of it. And similarly, the stuff, you know, the stuff I've written for, originally for Alien Underground and then for Data Side, it's kind of exploring uh, similar territory. So, yeah, that, that, got, that was an interesting period, really. Yeah? And I suppose... For me, about that whole kind of 90s clubbing scene, I, I just love the fact that going, there, was, there were just so many different genres and sub-genres and different things going on. You know, I loved it all, really. So I was just, I, me and Julie in particular, we, we went out to lots of places. So, yeah, I mean, in, in the, 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 from, you know, the mid-90s to the 90s, you know, that as a club in, in various forms was a, a massive part of my life. Me, my friends, um, partner Julie. Um, I'm... I guess so. I was quite a social butterfly and really liked going out to lots of different kinds of clubs and different kinds of scenes. There, was, there were so many sort of proliferating sub-genres and sub-sub-genres and so many different scenes. It, it, it's hard to really get a sense of how huge um, that different kinds of dance music was in the, in, the, in the mid-90s. I think now when you see a lot of stuff on TV in the 90s, you think that it was just like um, Britpop and, and a few raves earlier on. But, you know, it was absolutely a massive, massive scene and with lots of different scenes within it. Um, and, you know, I think within some of the, you know, like the, the more hardcore ends of the scene, you know, sometimes people were quite uh, snotty about uh, house music, quite snotty about what sometimes called handbag house, which is obviously a, you know, quite a dubious, uh, sexist, homophobic term. What's wrong with dancing around a handbag? And, yeah, I, I you know, I'm not ashamed to say I... Uh, Used to love all that stuff, and we used to go to um, Club UK in Wandsworth, which was a very much that kind of club, and uh, the Leisure Lounge, um, the Cross, which is up behind King's Cross, going to like Renaissance nights there, uh, Turn Mills, later on the Aquarium, which is that club up Old Street where they had a swimming pool in the room next door to it, and that's all the kind of mainstream house music based clubbing. Um, 
you know, I was, I was quite into the sort of the glam, the, the glam house side of it, the dressing up side of it. Yeah, well, that, that, that was, yeah, I mean, that was the interesting thing about some of them nights, almost like the fashion as well, because, yeah, there was almost that rave thing of like, yeah, all you need is like a T-shirt and some baggy trousers to sort of dance. But then at the same time, people always love dressing up and going out. And obviously there is a certain sexiness about going out, you know, you know, whether you like it or not. Uh, um, so, yeah, obviously, like some people just want to dance all night and sweat in a, a T-shirt. But then people still want to look good or dress up or, like you said, yeah, look good dancing in the in the, in the night. And there, there was definitely a lot of snobbishness there. I, I know I know I used to go like uh, Lost, which is a big sort of techno night. And they'd be really like, you know, snobby about me also going to like drum and bass jungle nights and be like, oh, are you going to that or rave rave clubs, you know? Yeah, and people were often very defensive around the boundaries of their own micro scenes, weren't they? Even Dead by Dawn, I remember people really didn't like, some people really didn't like people playing jungle there um, when they people first started doing it, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, that whole kind of glam, glam side of it, it kind of goes back to another strand, which is the kind of, the clean living in difficult circumstances mod. What does that mean? Clean living in difficult circumstances? I've heard that. Clean living in difficult circumstances. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a phrase comes from the sort of mod movement, but I guess it's basically the idea, you know, of kind of working class people refusing to accept, um, refusing to accept their station. No, no, for sure, man. It's always been a working class subculture of dressing up for the weekend and look, looking like a million dollars, even when you've got like two quid in your pocket or whatever, you know, you're looking the best. I, I can definitely identify with like the dressing up. So I see, I see that kind of, that strand of uh, 90s clubbing has been in that kind of line that goes back through to, to the mods and to other, other scenes where people were really into sharp dressing. Not that that was the only way of that. I mean, there was snobbish on both sides, wasn't there? Because, you know, at some of those glam house clubs, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be let in if you were wearing uh, t T-shirt and baggies. So. But equally, sometimes, I remember, you know, I remember sometimes going... I remember going to Dead by Dawn, like going to Club UK with my silver sparkly uh, Daniel James shot from Kensington High Street and then coming back down to Dead by Dawn later in the night and people were like, what? <laughs> yeah, but uh, did you talk about some of the gay clubs and stuff like that? Yeah, well, obviously interesting is because he- Heaven was, uh, I guess, as the, as the first established permanent gay club in London. And that, that really was the breeding ground for... Uh, a lot of early dance music. Yeah, I mean, I've talked many times about the early house nights. I went there, like Pyramid and stuff like that. Yeah, so I, I mean, the nineties, obviously, the big, the big uh, dance music night there was, uh, or mid nineties, as was we mentioned before, was Megatropolis, which was kind of a strange night. I mean, Heaven is such a great club. Um, I've been there on other nights as well, like Fruit Machine was the Wednesday night there, I think, but Thursday night was Megatropolis, and it's a great club with lots of different spaces in it, decent sound system, and lights and everything so um, a megatropolis was very much uh i guess again it's one of those clubs that people now think is not very cool but everyone everyone actually went to because what else you can do on a thursday night in london <laughs> most people be like going on about you know oh yeah how rubbish it was but yeah. they'd all be down there <laughs> like talking about how rubbish, how rubbish uh, um, it was fraser yeah. clark wasn't it who organized that yeah and i do remember actually i'll go into like i remember he did like a few lectures uh like you know like a year or two before then that I went to, he did a few events. I think one of them was I went to see Terence McKenna, which, you know, is classic sort of subcultural mushroom sort of, you yeah, know, say, expand yeah. your mind sort of author. And I think I saw he, he put in an event with Tibetan singing bowls where the, the monks, they, you know, they, they do the bowls and everyone sort of gets high from listening to these uh, mad frequencies from the bowls, which was quite amazing, actually, I've got to be honest. But yeah, it was quite, yeah, it was quite an odd club, Megatropolis. So that was, yeah, I mean, that was, I guess, an, as a, a coming at a turning point musically, um, when you start, started having, like, trance as a separate genre, splitting away from techno, I guess you'd call it, uh, or different forms of trance. It was kind of that hard acid trance sound, wasn't it? It was kind of liberators and stuff. Did you go down 414, did you, in Brixton? Because that was like... Yes, went 414 in Brixton. That that was more on the liberator side, the acid techno side, but the uh, then you had the kind of more psychedelic techno, which was really bringing in a, visually on uh, flyers and everything was bringing in a lot of, as you say, the kind of hippie culture elements and some of the people involved in it. So Fraser Clark, you mentioned, was the guy 
behind Mega Triplin as he was. He was basically an old hippie from the 60s, wasn't he? And I, I was always a bit suspicious of it, to be honest. It did feel a little bit like... Um, well, it did feel like Revenge of the Hippies, you know, that kind of, it was kind of that thing of, and I guess, yeah, some of us who did have more punk leaning were like, yeah, yeah, what the fuck is this? And uh, yeah, so in, uh, in the, um, the museum, they to a place uh, there was quite a few rooms, so you, it's basically kind of techno, but becoming more, more go- psychedelic trancey over time, I guess. Um, but then it would always be like rooms with talks going on and uh, like massage and brain machines and all the kind of uh, new agey uh, paraphernalia going on at the same time. Did brain machines actually do anything? Because, like, it's one of them. I haven't seen a brain machine for years, but it was a couple of years, like, every bloody room. You had, to, you had someone with them blinking lights and someone lying on the floor putting a, putting a brain machine on your eyes to try and sync the alpha or beta waves or whatever. Whatever. I think it's been shown that most people who use one at Megatropolis in the 90s uh, ended up becoming a... Covid to nine conspiracy theories twenty years later. So, so that that, that was actually quite a big night of the, of the, at that time, wasn't it? And there was loads of other scenes going on. I remember going to places like um, Speed, L, LTJ Bookham's Club, and then we had all these kind of Asian underground stuff. That remember that? Anoka and uh, Calcutta Cyber Cafe, and you know that sort of Asian drum and bass stuff. Talvin Singh. Yeah, there's just so many different things going on. But obviously, as everyone knows, uh, yeah, it got kind of crazy and crazier, and particularly the whole kind of in mainstream clubbing, the sort of super clubs, branding, superstar DJs. I mean, what do you think the start of that was? Was it like Ministry of Sound opening up and like, you know, that was that was start of the corporate sort of clubbing sort of bit? Or Yeah, I, don't know. I think that was the first, you know, permanent, club of that kind which really went into the branding of all the t-shirts and the thing and then a lot of other people followed suit or tried to didn't they uh not all successfully but um it did it did get overinflated. i mean i think um yeah i guess a turning point this is quite late on i think it's maybe as late as 1999 i remember we went to that night at the brixton academy and it was our man van helden oh my god versus fat boy slim and they had like a, yeah. a boxing booth in the middle of the dance floor, and he went well, on the dance floor. As I come on to in a second, you couldn't dance. Um, but they had a boxing ring in the middle of the academy, and then the, with like decks, and they were kind of in a, a face off. And uh, it was it, was a, it wasn't a bad night, but you know, it was it was totally unsuitable for dancing because the academy has got a sloping floor going down towards the stage. Yeah, it was a rubbish place for party. But also, you know, that, around that time as well, we started seeing people, uh, the whole club turning to dance towards the, the DJ. Um, which never, never, never used to see earlier on. I used, when I was DJing at that time, yeah, you'd be stuck in the corner somewhere, and people a lot of times wouldn't even know who was on the decks, you know, sort of thing. You you weren't elevated, and you know, you know, yeah, people weren't staring, looking at you. I still find that really weird, actually, when I DJ and people literally stand right next to the decks and just stare at you. I find that quite disconcerting when I'm playing music, and I, yeah, I do want to go look, just turn around and dance. Yeah, I mean, obviously people would always, well, not always, but sometimes would all turn around and give the DJ a cheer at the end of their set or whatever. But the the, the idea that you go to be, be like a gig where everyone would be facing the front, um, you know, that, that that seemed to me a, a kind of, in terms of the politics of it all as well, a kind of turning away from what made it more interesting, the kind of everybody is a star who's, who's there on a kind of semi-equal basis. So, yeah, it, it did overinflate, and obviously uh, there's backlash against that, and, you know, scenes have come and gone gone since. But it, it did did kind of grow to this crescendo through the 90s and then then kind of reached a point where I got a little bit sick of it as it, as it was. But then they then imported, exported the worst of it to uh, the States, I guess. But let's not go there. Um, so, yeah, later in the 90s, just kind of bringing towards the end, I suppose, um, there were some interesting things going on as well. Um, you know, reclaim the streets, the idea of having a, a massive um, party as a political protest. And I think they took that to another level with sort of, you know, bringing together like big sound systems on the on the M41 motorway. There was a big one in Brixton, wasn't it? I remember the one in Brixton. I was involved in, in helping organise parts of that. There was, um, by that point I had, I had kids, so I was in a sort of slightly different space. But um, I 
help to organise the, the children's area for the Brixton Reclaim the Streets party. So, you know, we've got loads of sand, out of sand pit, et cetera, et cetera. I was probably playing in the sand pit at one point. Yeah, my, my kids were folk, had their photos in DJ Mag, you know, running around in the gold wrapping or something. Yeah, so, I was, yeah, that, that was an interesting development in terms of, the, you know, using sound systems in, in a political way, I guess. And also, sort of late 90s, I was involved in... Um, something called the Association of Autonomous Astronauts, which was a, how to explain, I guess it was kind of a mixture of music and other cultural stuff, politics, but all based around a theme of uh, wouldn't it be cool if uh, we could uh, have autonomous community-run space flight. Um, and, um, yeah, there was a kind of one, one, one thread of that was about raising space and about what, what it would be like to uh, to dance in zero gravity. Quite a lot of people involved in music were uh, involved in that. Particular, one of the main people involved in it was um, Jason Skeet. Yeah, I went to I went to a few of the AAA, as it was known, uh, events. I played a bit of three sided football, and yeah. they had that thing about Luther Blissett, the uh, which obviously as a yeah, as a Luton fan, you're probably not too into Luther. What Watford? Why don't, yeah, why don't they call it exactly. Ricky Hill? Sorry. Sorry for the Luton in joke. Uh, um, but yeah, the autonomous astronauts was, was, was uh, 1995 to 2000. Um, space theme stuff. I mean, in that, me and Julie did something called each each person or small group of people did their own little version of the AAA. And that one was called Disco Nort, Disco Nort AAA. And it was all themed around, uh, you know, space disco and. You know, Sun Ra, George Clinton, um, looking at all these kind of space-themed Afrofuturist music and how that kind of was uh, prefiguring the, the, the days and where we'd have our, our autonomous communities in space. So that was good. And, and like uh, Dead by Dawn, some of the same people involved in it anyway, uh, there was an idea of having a definite end point. So like Dead by Dawn decided the 23 parties and that was it. Um, the Association of Autonomous Astronauts was based on a five-year plan, and the agreement was that at the end of the five years, which was in the year 2000, whatever else happened, it would finish at that point. And it did. I think the, the reason behind it was really the, uh, it's a good idea to have an endpoint when you start doing something because mo- most things become kind of cliched and boring after a little little while. Uh, so it's all you know. People always moan about things ending, but actually. Th- but they also moan about them not ending. If they go, if they go on forever, people get bored of it. And yeah, exactly. I mean, imagine if uh, Deborah Dorm was still going now, and uh, Christoph was the monkey pilot of the speed core scene. So yeah, I guess that's kind of sums up, you know, the nineties. Um, and uh, as we said at the beginning. Don't want to be nostalgic in the sense of it being like the best time ever. It was a good time, and there's good times now. But there was a lot of interesting things there, and probably a lot more going on than appears in a lot of the stuff you see. Well, well, well. Again, these chats—they're trying to just pick up just like, through storytelling of just like yeah, some of the some of the bits that aren't talked about, or like you said, some sometimes the diversity of the scene is is very easy. Just to, like you said, that I love I love the nineties. It will just be. Tony Blair, Oasis, Blur, and then yeah, maybe maybe some little rave footage or something. But oh, right, let's let, let's stop there for this this episode, Neil. We yeah. we convene at another time and chat about some different subjects. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. That's good. <laughs>